Hey D2 is the most bizarre game I think I've ever played. It's confusing, at times crushingly difficult, and it features the kind of subject matter that only someone from a non-English speaking background could possibly come up with. It's also a classic example, I think, of not judging a book by its heavily stacked upper body cover. I remember when the first game came out and it got discussed by other men of culture all around the world for obvious reasons, but it was a game that I could just never get into. Truthfully, I played the first game for about an hour or so and then I just gave up, due mostly to the platforming controls and the obtuse environment. And I don't think that I was alone in that either. According to the Steam achievements, only 40% of people who bought the game even bothered to get past the tutorial. Flash forward to the year of the apocalypse 2020 and here we are with the sequel, HD 2 And from a glance, it doesn't look all that different. That is until you realise they've removed all of the platforming. Yeah, compared to the frequent and the downright distracting platforming in the first game, they've now done away with that entirely. Other than that though, in HD 2 much like the first game, you're still playing as what can only be described as a real doll, only this time she's got an actual face. In fact, you can even customise her appearance by choosing from a bunch of hairstyles and colours and a grand total of two outfits. One that could be best described as evening casual, and another that could be best described as evening tactical. And if nothing else, again, she does win the award for one of the thickest protagonists in any game I've played in recent memories. Let me just say, if I ever get killed in real life, I hope it's by getting smothered to death by a pair of thighs like that. I think it's a nice touch too how when you spin the camera around she looks directly into it like she's judging you. Yeah, that's not disturbing at all. Anyway, HD is again trapped in some kind of labyrinthian complex with no clue of what's going on or how to get out. And I'd say that no clue is the best way to sum up the whole experience. With this one you can really see the influence that it takes from survival horror, mostly games like Resident Evil and Dead Space. It's also got those heavy Metroidvania elements, with this fast complex able to be explored and obstacles every 5 seconds, needing some kind of key card or crucial item to get past. The difference between HD2 though and its influences is that in this game it gives you absolutely no assistance, or even a general idea of what you're supposed to be doing. As the game starts, you crawl through a nearby vent, given the kind of view that allows you to see what our main character had for breakfast, but that's about all there is to it. I mean, there's notes scattered around the complex, but they're not really going to assist you or give you any kind of idea of what your main goal is supposed to be. HD2 seems to wear this like some kind of badge of honour as well. The Steam store page describes it as not giving you any clues or directions. There's no interactive maps, no health regeneration, no objective markers, and it even boasts how it won't give you enough ammo or health kits. And yeah, look, that's fine and all, but I think there's a difference between a game being enjoyably hard and challenging, than a game just being a straight up asshole. I'm kinda torn on this one, because I mean, on the one hand, when I was playing it, I often found myself incredibly frustrated and pissed off. I actually got a bit of a sore throat from shouting at this game so much, which you can probably still hear in my voice. But then on the other hand, there's something so addictive about the puzzle aspect and wanting to beat the game like it actually takes center stage over everything else. You almost kind of forget that you're playing as a cyborg lady with an ass that's big enough to block out the sun. I mean, look at that thing. God damn. Your main goal, as you'll find out, is to escape the complex. And the way you have to do this is by restarting the power core, then escaping in a ship from the hangar. And yeah, that sounds easy enough, only there's about a hundred things you'll need to do to get there. Do you remember that scene from Malcolm in the Middle when Hal just keeps finding all these things around the house he needs to fix? Well, that's the best way to sum up the whole experience here. In the first game, you had to get key cards before you could even get into some of the different zones. Here though, it's almost all accessible from the get-go in some capacity. My biggest issue with HD2 though is the lack of descriptions for the couple of dozen crucial items you find in the game. Like Resident Evil, you've got those save rooms that have those magical item boxes, which let you access them from any other save room. And again, you're going to be picking things up that you'll eventually need to use at some point in the game. But there's no description whatsoever on what any of these items are supposed to be. And in some instances, they don't even look like what they're supposed to be in the first place. Like, what do you think these things are? Well, if you've played the first game, you'll know that they're supposed to be access cards for locked doors. Except I've never seen an access card look like that in any other video game I've ever played. Probably doesn't help that I'm colorblind either, and that all these access cards just look like different shades of grey. In the first game, when you'd come across an item for the first time, there was often some kind of sequence where you'd get to use it right away. So you knew right off the bat what it was and how it worked. 
Hate E2 though often instead doesn't do that. Probably the best example of this I had in the game was when I found a pair of what I thought was supposed to be surgical scissors. And I thought that maybe there's some kind of dead body with something hidden inside its stomach or something. But no, apparently these are forceps and you've got to use them in a drained pool to grab a USB stick, oh sorry, access card out of the drain. And the only way that I even managed to find this out was by trawling through the Steam forums to see if some poor asshole was as stuck as I was. You'll need to stash away every single thing you find in this game too, because every single hallway and area has some kind of locked door or blocked passageway that you need to get through. Some of these are obvious and self-explanatory, like you'll need to use a screwdriver to get through vents or a lockpick to open locked chests, I mean it makes sense. And if you've played the first game, you'll know how to use that little dildo wand and how to defuse the mines with a pair of pliers. But it's the ones that aren't where you'll be spending literally hours of your time trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing with them. I didn't even know that I could make my own ammo until I was about halfway through the game. Throughout the game you keep coming across these little coloured tubs which I thought were supposed to be tubs of paint, but actually it's like the gunpowder in the Resident Evil games, and you can mix and match these to make different ammo types. I just think simple inventory pop-ups to say what these items are just would have been an absolute godsend. Look, you can keep your confusing layouts with the environments, keep in all of the dead ends and locked doors that you want, but just a simple leg up with the basic definition of these items just would have been really handy. Even Hexen 2, which I think is one of the most confusing and non-handholding games I've ever played, would still say what something was when you picked that up. Now the complex is broken up between half a dozen different wings like medical, engineering and security. And then these wings also often have multiple floors. And these are all defined by the colour of the walls. It's kind of very similar to the red, green and yellow zones from the first game. And again, not ideal for a colourblind person. Overall, there is a fair bit to see and do here. And the price is justified, I think, in that sense. And that despite it only taking place in one location, you're still going to spend upwards of 10 or so hours finding your way out. I mean, at least. Truthfully too, for an indie game, it doesn't look all that bad. I think the lighting effects are great, and you do get a sense of this complex being somewhat real and lived in. The first game felt like barren, empty testing chambers, these environments disconnected from reality. Oops, there goes gravity. But now you'll move through offices, locker rooms, and bathrooms, with the right amount of props scattered around to emphasize that this was a place that was once populated. And it is a lot better looking than just endless rooms of white brick walls and red pipes. There's living quarters, a cafeteria with a chef that's even still on the clock, along with all of the other accoutrements that you'd expect to come across in a facility that basically seems to be mass producing sex dolls. I mean, I don't even know what's supposed to have gone on in this room. Heidi looks like the kind of thing you'd see in a 3D character model library though, and her proportions just look uncomfortable. They've even added in boob physics when she moves about, which makes it look like she's on the moon smuggling watermelons under her top. And her walk-in animation is the stuff you only see at a Bucks night party, after losing a few hundred bucks to alcohol, cocaine and poor judgement. Oh yeah, and who could forget all the bizarre posters on the walls in this thing? Yeah, anyone else remember Max Gain? The engine even somehow pulls off working mirrors, which for a PC game in 2020 is just black magic. Mad Dad Erection? That doesn't even make any sense. Doesn't make any sense! It's a shame the sound is completely lacking. The music is droning, repetitive and depressing, sounding like a funeral march if it was composed by Kraftwerk. And the sound effects for the weapons sound like wet farts. Speaking of the shooting, a fair chunk of the game is spent shooting things. Well, shooting two things in particular, because there's only two types of enemies in the entire game. You've got these slow moving zombie guys that look a bit like the regenerators from Resident Evil 5. And then these things, which are like sex dolls with praying mantis arms and a geth head from Mass Effect. It is kind of lazy though in that they're pretty much just reskinned versions of the same enemies from the first game, the same behavior and even the same tactics. Enemies aren't particularly smart though, and their tactics just consist of rushing towards you, often as soon as you enter a room. I mean, they probably heard the sound of those dummy thick ass cheeks clapping around. The weaponry is also kind of limited. You've got a pistol, submachine gun, shotgun, and I guess a rifle. And while the shooting is pretty rudimentary, if nothing else, the random nature of the physics can sure make it interesting. Headshots do more damage than body shots, and you can also upgrade these weapons too. Increasing accuracy, capacity, and damage, but it's about the bare minimum amount of mechanics needed to call it a third-person shooter. And I know the Steam page says they don't give you enough ammo or health kits, but I actually kind of found it to be the complete opposite. I always seem to have more than enough to kill every single enemy that I came across. 
even more so once I'd figured out I could make my own ammo. But don't go in expecting any kind of fun shooting experience though, because the combat is absolutely dog shit. The combat isn't hard by itself, but the problem is that you can't ever really run past enemies in this game. Again, unlike in the many games that this thing takes influence from, avoiding enemies to save ammo just isn't a possibility, because the hallways in the corridors are so narrow, and if you ever get caught in a corner, it's basically curtains. One of the cheapest tricks they pull is spawning in enemies when you're not expecting it. So suddenly you find yourself ambushed from behind and completely blocked in. Sometimes you can catch this in time, but others you're not so lucky. What I think really grinds my balls down to a fine pace though, is that if an enemy is chasing you and you then leave the room, when you go back in later, they're still going to be standing right at the door waiting for you, and they'll just often instantly kill you. Every time you take a hit, you get stunned and knocked back. And it is possible to just get stun locked to death. In fact, it's more than possible and something you better get used to, bitch. Speaking of getting used to things, you better get used to dying from the mines in this game. Honestly, the amount of fucking explosive mines you have to watch out for in this thing is just on another level. And they're just so often put in these lame, hard to see places as a trap for first time players. Early on in the game, you learn that you can disarm them with pliers and then place them down wherever you want to. But this is just so inconsistent and I've lost count of the amount of times the diffusing doesn't work and it's just blown up in my face. No matter how crappy some of the areas in this game are though, let me assure you that they saved the best for last. The last sequence in this game is when you have to reactivate the power and shortly after that you've got 10 minutes to escape the base before the whole thing explodes. And this 10 minutes is one of the most sadistic, cruel things I've experienced in a video game in recent memory. It's a battle of trial and error as you keep getting killed by obscurely placed mines and enemy ambushes. You die and then you learn from your mistake. Reload a save file before you then die again to something else you again couldn't have really seen coming. And your reward for all of this is one of the most unclimactic endings I think I've ever seen. On some level, you have got to kind of admire the devs for sticking to their guns though. Outside of removing the platforming stuff, which let's face it was pretty horrible, this is just a more developed and improved version of the first game. And it really knuckles down on those elements that made it so challenging. I finished the game on the so-called softcore difficulty mode in about 11 hours. And if that's the game's version of softcore, well, I can't imagine what they've got in store for the hardcore mode. Taking a quick look through Steam achievements, it's even more plain to see how divisive this thing is. With the basic achievement for just finishing the game, not even 2% of people who own it have managed to pull it off. It is going to piss off a lot of fans of the original, I guess, how there's no more platforming anymore, but considering some of those were about as fun as pissing into your own face, I really don't see it as any kind of great loss. What I think's really going to keep this thing kicking along is the community. I know the first game has a pretty big modding scene and I think speedrunners are going to find this thing appealing too. There's even another achievement for finishing it in under 60 minutes. I mean, fuck. In a way, I think Hades' distracting figure is kind of a detriment to the game. If they had have toned down that sexual overtone, I think this might have been taken more seriously because it really is one of the most challenging puzzle games I think I've ever played. It's just going to be hard for people to ignore that stigma of playing as a buxom robot in a high-cut One Piece with boobs that are big enough to crush coconuts. Damn! Still though, there is definitely a demographic out there that enjoys these kind of hardcore, relentless, no mercy experiences. And Hey D2, in that regard, is definitely up there with the best of them. Surprise, motherfucker. 